Please welcome Mr. Thomas Friedman of the New York Times. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. I've been meeting people for breakfast in Washington, D.C. over the last few years, and people would come late some mornings, 10, 15 minutes late, come up and say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And one day I said to one of them, just spontaneously, uh, actually, Greg, thank you for being late. Uh, because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. And people started to get into it. They'd say, uh, well, 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 you're welcome. Because they understood what I was doing, that in this age of accelerations, I was giving them and myself the time to pause. My friend Dove Seidman, in fact, is quoted in the beginning of the book saying, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to think, it starts to step back, it starts to reflect, it starts to reimagine. And if there was ever a time we need to pause, reflect, and reimagine, it is right now in what I call the age of acceleration. So um, what this book basically is, is I look at the world as a big data set and what I'm gonna give you in the next 40 minutes is my algorithm. The algorithm I use to look at, understand, and connect events. The book actually begins, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, um, and I drive to, I take the subway to work about once a week. And um, I drive from my home in Bethesda to the uh, uh, Bethesda Hyatt, and I park in the public parking garage below the Bethesda Hyatt. I did that almost three years ago now, and um, came into DC on the red line, came back, driving home, had my time stamp ticket, uh, came to the cashier's booth in the parking garage, gave the ticket to the cashier. He looked at it and looked at me and said, I know who you are. I said, great. He said, I read your column. I said, great. He said, I don't always agree. I said, great, get me out of here. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I drove off. A week later, I did my weekly trip to DC, came back, Timestamp ticket, same guy's there. This time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? I thought, oh my God, the parking guy is now my competitor. <laughs> what the hell just happened? So I said, write it down for me, I'll look it up. I looked, it was called odinambi.com. I, I went home, looked it up. Uh, he's Ethiopian, writes about Ethiopian politics. Um, I thought about him for about a week, and I decided this was a sign from God. I should pause and engage with this guy, but he didn't have his email. So all I could do was park in the parking garage every day and see if we would overlap, which I did for a week. We finally overlapped. I said to him, then I knew his name, Ayile, I want your email. Um, I sent him an email that night. He gladly gave it to me. And I said, I have a proposition for you. I will teach you how to write a column if you will tell me your life story. And he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. Um, we met two weeks later at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda. And I presented him with, he told me his life story. I won't deal with that this morning. Uh, but I presented him with a six-page memo on how I write a column, which is basically my algorithm for solving this big data set. I explained to him that a news story is meant to inform, but a column is meant to provoke. I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's what I do, either heating or lighting. I'm either stoking up an emotion inside of you or I'm illuminating something for you, and ideally, I'm doing both, and if I do, I will produce a reaction. But I explained to him that to create heat and light actually requires uh, mixing three chemicals. The first is what is your value set? How do you lean into the world? Are you a Keynesian, a Marxist, a capitalist, a neocon, a libertarian? What is, your, what is your political program you're promoting? Second, and that's gonna be the thrust of my talk today, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places, in more ways, on more days? Because as a columnist, 
I'm always carrying around in my head a working hypothesis of the gears and pulleys in the world, how they interact, and how they drive events. Once I called it Lexus and the Olive Tree, once I called it World is Flat, once about the Middle East I called it Beirut to Jerusalem. But I'm always carrying around in my head a constantly updating hypothesis of how the machine works. Because as a columnist, what I'm trying to do is take my values and push the machine. And if I don't know how it works, I either will push them in the wrong direction or I won't push it at all. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? How the machine affects people and culture and how people and culture come back and affect the machine. Stir those three together, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes. If you do it right, you'll produce either heat or light or both. What I want to talk to you about this morning is the central part of the book, which is how I think the machine works today. I think what is driving more things in more ways, in more places, on more days, is that we are in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three biggest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. Mother Nature for me is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. Uh, and if you put it on a graph, if you put Mother Nature on a graph, she looks like a hockey stick. The market for me is globalization, but not the way economists define it, because they define it as basically uh, you know, containers on ships and, and just financial flows. That's not the key globalization today. We are in a new era of globalization. It's digital globalization. I'm talking Twitter, Facebook, PayPal, everything that is being digitized and flowing globally today. And if you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And thirdly, Moore's Law. Moore's Law, coined by Gordon Moore, that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. That's actually been going on for 50 years now. Don't let anybody tell you it's slowing down. It's not. They don't know what they're talking about. If you put Moore's Law on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. We're actually in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time of the three largest forces on the planet, and they're all interacting with each other. More Moore's Law drives more globalization, more globalization drives more climate change, and more solutions to climate change drives immigration as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. So let me quickly go through those three accelerations. The second chapter of the book is called What the Hell Happened in 2007? 2007 sounds like such an innocuous year. What's this guy talking about? Well, the chapter begins actually in December 2006 in a soccer field in Palo Alto where Steve Jobs pulls out of his pocket the first iPhone and shows it to John Doerr, the founder, one of the leading partner at Kleiner Perkins. In 2007, a month later at the Moscone Center in San Francisco, Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone. That's what happened in 2007. But you know what else happened in 2007? Facebook came out in 2007. It was confined to high schools and universities before that. It actually came out in September 2006. 2007, something called Twitter came out. In 2007, uh, something called Hadoop came out. Uh, for the techies among you, you'll know that Hadoop is what basically created big data. In uh, 2007, uh, GitHub came out. GitHub's the biggest open source software repository in the world now. It grows at a million users a month. In 2007, the Kindle came out. 2007, Google bought YouTube. In 2007, Airbnb came out. In 2007, Android came out. In 2007, IBM Watson came out. In 2007, Palantir started. In 2007, Change.org came out. In 2007, Michael Dell, who retired in 2005 because he thought he was done, decided he sure as hell better come back in 2007. Look at a graph of sequencing the human genome, the cost of sequencing the hum human genome. It looks like this, and then a waterfall. Look at the bottom of the graph. The date is 2007. In 2007, solar, look at a graph of solar energy. It looks like this. The takeoff point is 2007. And of course, in 2007, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon uh, in making uh, its chips and extended Moore's Law into a whole new generation. 2007, friends, I believe will be seen in time as the single greatest technological inflection point 
since Gutenberg invented the printing press. And we, we completely missed it because of 2008. Oh, we know what happened. Everyone will tell you what happened in 2008. We had a global economic crisis, went into recession. Our government went into gridlock. And basically what happened in 2007 was our physical technologies leapt ahead. It was like we were all on a moving sidewalk that was going five miles an hour and suddenly sped up to 35 miles an hour and everything else froze. All the social technologies around it, basically that we needed to keep up with 2007, just froze. And we are living today with the political implications of that dislocation. So 2007 was a very big year. It was a vintage year in wine and in history. So what did it do for, for um, uh, technology? So um, basically, let's talk specifically about Moore's Law, which is what produced 2007. So Gordon Moore 50 years ago uh, said that speed and power microchips will double roughly every two years and the price will stay the same. It's now closer to two and a half. Never mind, you've never seen an exponential like that. One of the most difficult things for the human mind to grasp is the power of an exponential. We, we just don't encounter them very often. And the story that Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee tell in their book, uh, which I find is the best way to explain, is the story of the man who invented the game of chess. He gave the game to the king, king loved it, said, how can I reward you, good sir? And the man said, your highness, I just want to be able to feed my family. It shall be done, said the king, what would you like? He said, I'd actually like you to take just one grain of rice, sir, and put it on the first square of this chessboard. Put two on the next, four on the next, eight on the next, 16 on the next, just keep doubling it, my family will be fine. <clears throat> the king said, it shall be done, <clears throat> not realizing that when you double something 63 times, the number you get is 18 quintillion. More rice than existed in the whole world. As Andy and Eric note, we just entered the second half of the chessboard, right around 2007. When the doubling starts to get so big, you start to see really funky stuff. You start to see cars that can drive themselves, and you start to see machines with all five senses. Intel uh, did this uh, study, which I like to cite to underscore the power of an exponential. They took the 1971 VW Beetle and said, geez, what would, what would a Beetle, a VW Beetle look like today if it improved at the rate of Moore's Law? Well, the number their engineers came up with is that it would um, uh, travel at 300,000 miles an hour, it would get two million miles per gallon, and it would cost four cents. And by the way, you'd be able to drive that VW Beetle your entire life on one tank of gas. That's where we are with this uh, acceleration in technology. And basically what happened right around 2007, oh, by the way, if you take a look at a graph, which I have in my book of, uh, uh, well, basically what happened is in 2007, two things came together. One has to do with a book I wrote in 2004 called The World is Flat. What that book was about was a collapse in the price of connectivity. Uh, because of the dot-com boom, bubble, and bust, the price of connectivity globally collapsed, and we accidentally shrunk the world, so much so that I could treat the back room of a company in Bangalore as the back room of my company here in Washington. And I gave that moment a name. Uh, I said, the world is flat. Suddenly, I'm being touched by people who could never touch me before, and I can touch people who could I could never touch before. Um, I actually wrote the... Uh, 2.0 edition, 1.0 in 2005, 2.0 in 2006, and 3.0 edition of that book in 2007, and then I stopped thinking, I'm done, I've got it figured out. 2007 was a really bad year to stop sniffing glue, I can tell you, um, and to stop that book. Um, so we had a price collapse in connectivity. What happened in 2007 was another price collapse, and it was a price collapse in the power of compute and storage. And what it did was make complexity free. So the world is flat was about a moment when connectivity became fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous. In 2007, the collapse in the price of compute and storage, we could suddenly compute and store so much more, made, co made complexity fast, free, easy for you, and invisible. 
So the world is flat was about a moment when I could touch and be touched by people I never imagined before. And the world in 2007 is about everything I could now do with one touch. The obvious example is Uber. Five years ago, catch a cab. Hey, I'm at 1700 Jefferson. Taxi, taxi, no taxi, it's starting to rain. Uh, Barwood taxi, I'm at 1700 Jefferson. 30 minutes, all of that complexity got abstracted into one touch, and that is happening everywhere. Now, when you make connectivity fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous, and you make complexity fast, free, easy for you, and invisible, what you get is the cloud. You get this incredible energy source. But I never use the term the cloud, because it sounds so benign, so fluffy, so soft. Sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from both sides. This ain't no fucking cloud, okay? This is a supernova. This is the greatest release of energy in nature, which is the explosion of a star. And this supernova now is at the center of everything. Just as in the Middle Ages, you wanted to build your town on a river because it brought you transportation, energy, ideas, and food. Today, you want to build your town on the Amazon. Today, you want to build it on Amazon.com. It's who is connected to the flows off this supernova that is going to thrive most in the age of accelerations. That's the technology acceleration. It drives, of course, the globalization acceleration. And we all know the numbers, how basically you know, half the planet today now has a, a connection to a network or an iPhone. Um, we, we all know how connectivity has vastly accelerated. I'm not going to go into that. The third acceleration is in climate population and biodiversity loss. Now we're getting a little closer to where I'm going to go to connect to your world. I actually begin that chapter with a, a story of last July, when um, not this year, the year before, when there was a temperature reading in Bandar Mashar in the Persian Gulf on what was the date? I've got it here. Um, July 31st, 2015, it was 163 degree heat index. Um, uh, that's a combination of temperature and humidity. We're going off the charts here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the uh, NASA and, and NOAA keep temperature records. They've actually been keeping temperature records for 1,639 months. Actually, now 1,640 months. And August was the hottest temperature of all 1,640 months. So this acceleration is also going off the charts. The basic argument of my book is that these accelerations are not just changing things. They are fundamentally reshaping the world in which we live. And they're reshaping five realms in particular. Politics, geopolitics, the workplace, ethics, and community. So let me talk about geopolitics and how it connects up with your conference here on immigration and migration. How these three accelerations are reshaping that world. So the chapter on geopolitics in my book is called um, uh, Control Versus Chaos. Uh, some of you may get the joke, if you're old enough, I'm 63 years old, I was a big fan of Get Smart when I grew up, and if you remember, the organization Don Adams, the spoof on James Bond, the organization he worked for was called Control. And their worldwide enemy was called Chaos, spelled K-A-O-S. Oh, the authors of that show were so far ahead of their time, okay? Because I believe what these three accelerations are doing is basically the following. So World War I and World War II, we know, gave empires, gave way to a raft of independent nation states. Over 190 now. Many of these nation states, as you all know, have borders who are, that are primarily straight lines and right angles. Now, the 50 years of the Cold War 
were a great time to be a weak little state whose borders were straight lines because there were two superpowers to throw money at you. Foreign aid. You could be Syria, they'd rebuild your army three times. They'd educate your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow or Wichita State in America. They'd give you money for education, for roads, they'd build your stadium. It was a time when populations were low, so everyone had a demographic dividend. More young people to support fewer old people. It was a time when China, for most of that era, could not take away their low-wage labor. Uh, it was a time when the climate was relatively benign. You can kiss that era goodbye. We are now in the age of accelerations, and each one of those things that made it easy to be an independent little state with straight line borders has completely vanished. Now everything is in reverse. China can take your low wage labor overnight. That's if Vietnam doesn't do it first. So all those startup industries first rung on the ladder like textile, forget about that. By the way, if China and uh, Vietnam don't do it, a robot will now. Um, the two superpowers, nobody wants to touch you, basically, because they've learned all you win is a bill, okay? Um, climate is now off the charts. Population, I was just in Niger, population 1950, 2.5 million, population today 17.5 million, population 2050, 72 million. So everyone now is heading for demographic deficit. And the rising skills you need now for the global economy are such that if you cannot educate your kids in a world where uh, coding now becomes the fourth skill you need with reading, writing, and arithmetic, you can't compete. And therefore, what is happening, in my view, is my th these states, and I would start with West Africa in the Sahel and go all the way across to the border of India, these states basically are like caravan homes in a trailer park. They're built on no foundation and they have no basement. And my three accelerations are like a tornado going through a trailer park. That's what you're seeing. And we're just at the beginning of it. These, these states cannot stand up to these accelerations. And the states that are gonna go first are the most artificial, those whose borders are primarily straight lines. Beware of those countries. They're the ones that are gonna go first. And therefore, the new geopolitical divide in the world, in the age of accelerations, is no longer north, south, east, west, communist, capitalist. The new relevant geopolitical divide is between the world of control and the world of chaos, the world of order and the world of disorder. The dividing line today is the Mediterranean, and what you are seeing are tens of thousands of people who are just at the beginning, you're just seeing the trickle, who are going to try to get out of the world of disorder into the world of order. And I think we're just at the beginning. I just completed a documentary for National Geographic, it'll also be out in November for the Years of Living Dangerously series. We started in uh, northern Senegal, um, at what I call the headwaters of the human migration from Africa. Um, and we followed refugees from there across to Niger to Agadez um, every Monday in Agadez um, uh, at dusk, happens every Monday. Um, we stood at the border station, basically, you know, several thousand refugees gather there every Monday. They pile into Toyota Jeeps. The caravan we followed had 200 jeeps. They're all young men. They gather there from all over West Africa. Um, uh, Agadez, which used to be a, is a UNESCO heritage site, has completely lost its tourist industry. It's been completely repurposed into human migration now, all of these trucks. Um, at dusk, the trucks all gather these men from safe houses. They gather in a giant caravan, and they make the dash for Dirku, Libya, and hopefully the coastline. Happens every Monday. We traveled there with the UN ambassador for desertification. Uh, the UN estimates about 9,000 a month are making this trip. And that's why, I don't know what statistics um, are, are exactly correct, but uh, the UN estimates that three quarters of the refugees coming to Europe are not coming from the Arab Muslim world. 
They are coming from the Sahel and West Africa, and all you need to do is go to the headwaters in Senegal to understand why, because we went to villages there, and the minute you sit down with the villagers and the chief gathers everyone together, you immediately get the picture. There are no men in these villages. It's like a neutron bomb hit them. Everyone from age 18, basically, to 55, there are no men. They have all hit the road because climate change has completely uh, destroyed their agriculture. That and a combination, not completely destroyed, but heavily enfeebled. Their populations are off the charts. And um, uh, rising temperature, the land simply cannot sustain these people. Uh, they do not want a Live Aid concert with Michael Jackson. They're not into We Are the World. They want to get out. They want to get to Europe. They've got cell phones. They can see it. The smugglers have a whole WhatsApp network that they use to now recruit these people. They are coming, and you're just seeing the trickle. Um, this is going to be a huge, huge challenge uh, for Europe, first of all, but not only Europe. You may have noticed Israel got over 60,000 refugees from Eritrea and South Sudan, and it wasn't for the kosher food. They walked, basically, from Eritrea and South Sudan, across Africa, across the Sinai. Uh, they now are 60,000 of them in Israel. The Israelis don't know what to do with them. We, of course, in this country last year got 52,000 orphans from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, incidentally the three most uh, deforested countries in Central America. Um, so all of these forces are now interplaying all right, to create this uh, human migration challenge. Um, when I think about geopolitics today, therefore, I really think about four interrelated challenges. I mean, it was so easy to be an American Secretary of State in the 50s and 60s. I mean, let's be honest. You just had to think about basically one problem, but let's call it one and a half, Russia and China. You had to think about the big power problem. And that problem is now back. We thought it sort of went away. Um, there was the, Cold, uh, the I, I divide history between the Cold War, the post-Cold War, which was basically from 1989 until the early 2000s, let's call it roughly 9-11, and now the era I think we're in is the post-Cold -post War. And the post-post-Cold War um, poses four interrelated geopolitical challenges. The first is great power politics. It's back. We know that. Ask Colin Powell. Um, somebody just got into his email. Um, uh, and we have an inkling who that was, okay? So it's back with all the golden old default lines. Uh, Ukraine, Eastern Europe, uh, Syria with the Russians, and the South China Sea with the Chinese. I'm not gonna talk about that, you're all familiar with it. It's all about balance of power. But we got three new interrelated geopolitical challenges that are all the byproduct of the age of acceleration. The first is interdependence. You see, one of the features of the age of acceleration is that the world is no longer just interconnected or hyperconnected. It is now interdependent. That's what happens when globalization goes off the charts. So what's lost there is felt here. And we all know how interdependent the world is. We see it when you turn on CNBC in the morning, but it's interdependent in a variety of ways. What this interdependence is doing is creating a geopolitical inversion that has several features. First of all, your friends in an interdependent world can kill you much faster than your enemies. So if Greece goes bankrupt tomorrow, there isn't an American in this room whose 401k or savings account will not be affected. If Brexit happens, oh my God. I mean, I don't even want to even think about how you all and, and me, we will be affected in an interdependent world because your friends can kill you much faster than your enemies. And at the same time, your rivals falling becomes more dangerous than your rivals rising. Yeah, I'm worried about China and the South China Sea chasing after a bunch of rocks, building airstrips, um, and uh, you know, Putin mucking around in Crimea. Um, you know, I, I don't enjoy watching that. But I got news for you. What really scares me is Putin-Russia collapsing. 
Uh, my grandmother used to say, Tommy, never destabilize a country that spans nine time zones. Grandma used to say that, okay? And I don't even want to imagine the impact on my retirement savings of China melting down. Russia and China collapsing in an interdependent world is so much more dangerous than them rising. Second new challenge is disintegrationism, these states falling apart. Because see, in the old days, what would happen if you had all this disorder? We know what would happen. An empire would come in and establish order. It would be called the British Empire, or the German Empire, or the Ottoman Empire. But we're now in a post-empire era. We're in a post-colonial era. And I would argue we're in a post-authoritarian era as well. So there ain't no empire going to come in and sort out the world of disorder. And because everyone knows, as I said, all you win is a bill. And that's why ISIS and Boko Haram, I mean, we kind of send in special ops. That's you guys. That's why you're all, you know, so popular these days. Because we cannot call you, you boots on the ground. We're not there. We're there. We poke at the problem. But then we don't have to own it, OK? Um, uh, and that's basically why God invented special ops, OK? <laughs> because you are there for us in a post-colonial, post-empire world to deal with this problem in ways that we don't have to think about. Uh, the problem is, uh, this problem is so much bigger than, than the talented people in your operations can possibly handle, uh, because um, you cannot address these problems without rebuilding whole states and societies and environments that have fundamentally collapsed. Uh, the third problem, a new geopolitical problem, is the problem of what I call makers and breakers. So one thing that this technological acceleration does, this is a great time to be a maker. Well, if you want to make something today, start up a company, you were born at the right time. This is an amazing time to be a maker. But when the world is good for makers, it's also fantastic for breakers. And if you want to break something today, you are also living in the greatest era of history. So smaller and smaller units can now deliver greater and greater threats and impacts. And we all know the IED story, uh, how we spent you know, God knows how many billions of dollars fortifying our equipment against IEDs, and they spent hundreds building those weapons. So geopolitics today is actually managing four different balances of power. The balance of power between us and other great powers, the balance of power between us and disintegrating states, uh, the balance of power between makers and breakers, and the balance of power between us and all the people we're integrated with. As Waylon Jennings would have put it, mama, don't let your daughters grow up to be secretaries of state. This is the worst time in history to be Secretary of State. If anybody offers you that job in the next admi administration, tell them you had your heart set on Secretary of Agriculture. <laughs> um, let me stop there and, and uh, I'll leave some time for some questions. So. Thank you. Please. Somebody bring me a water. Just toss me that water up there. Thank you. Uh, I've not read your book, sir. I'm sorry. I would I promise that I would get it and I would read it. But at That's least the part of it that I heard, I wish that I was that um, parking guy that I was impressing you to write wonderful piece about Afghanistan before Thank you were writing all those projections that most of them got wrong. So I want to tell you that, do you feel some responsibility about all your wonderful pieces about Afghanistan that you impressed a lot of people, you influenced, influenced a lot of policymakers, and those predictions didn't come right? First is that one. Second, me, but my predictions about Afghanistan? I, I definitely. A lot of your papers were controversial, and a lot of things were starting from defining the war in Afghanistan, specifically about the Taliban 
or the people who were praying, in fact, that when another, uh, another missile would be there, then possibly they, they would banish Taliban and all the other stuff. So you were speaking about the operation in Afghanistan's time, which was very sensitive. And the time when we were working at the embassy, so uh, we, your pieces were telling us that you know better the Taliban mentality than the government or the U.S. government. So your pieces were like this for us, um, uh, problematic. So um, you, might, you might have confused me. I barely wrote about Afghanistan. I've only been there twice. Um, there I was one quote of you that you were saying very that little about it. So the, the Afghan people were praying that there was another bomb, at least possibly, to finish the Taliban. So that word, how could you speak that the people were praying for another bomb? That is your word. So quote mm -hmm. unquote. Uh, so there are a lot of other pieces of you maybe than that line. But you are a wonderful man. You are influencing us. Everybody knows. So me, give you, me your question, okay? I'm really not interested in, in, in reliving all this. Give me your okay. question. Do you, do you admit that you, your predictions were not right, specifically uh, you, about Afghanistan? Why don't you come up with a specific thing and I'll answer it, okay? The way you were defining the enemy was from your perspective, not perspective that you knew, in fact, what the type of enemy we have. We are not dealing with a kind of war like the time against Soviet Union, the enemy was defined, the friend was defined. We are so mixed with each other, and a person like you who was coming, in fact, from out of the government, uh, your pieces were, were defining the enemy, defining the Afghan mentality, and you had a very loud voice, and you were being coded, in fact, by, uh, by, by our politicians that, okay, this is according to your assessment. So that's what I want to say. I, uh, I, I, um, again, I've, I've been to Afghanistan, uh, uh, I believe twice. I wrote very little about it. I've written very little today. Um, I think uh, you'd have to tell me a specific. I, I really don't remember any such thing. So um, if you come up with a specific, I'm happy to respond to it, okay? Um, but this kind of general sense that I'm responsible for um, uh, your, your, the American impression about Afghanistan, I wish that were true. I wish I even knew that much about it, but I'm afraid I don't. Yeah. When you, when you talk about accelerations, the, the challenge dilemma in a bureaucracy is we don't move fast to begin with. So how do you see or our ability to kind of adapt to that? Because that's gonna, I would think, be a little bit of a challenge. It's a really good question because when the world gets fast, slow becomes really slow. So slow becomes really, really slow. I have a graph, and I'm sorry I couldn't illustrate it here in the book that was drawn for me by Astro Teller, the head of Google X. Um, and so imagine a graph, you know, and there are two lines in the graph. One has a slightly positive slope and goes like that. And another starts below it like that and then goes like that. And then he drew an X above that line. So that line is the average rate at which human beings and societies adapt to change over time. So it has a positive slope, but it's very gradual. Down here is technology. So if you lived in the 11th century, the 13th century, things didn't change very much. The line, pretty flat. And then you get Galileo and Copernicus and then Moore's Law and it starts to go straight up. The X now is above the line. That is, I would argue, and Astro would argue, that the pace of technological change today is faster than the average human being in society can adapt. So technology, and by the way, it just gets faster. So we get the new iPhone 7, you know, faster than everything starts to come a little bit faster. And um, uh, um, yet the pace that societies need to adapt, look at the story of Uber in Pittsburgh now. They're gonna test out self-driving taxis, but they don't have any regulation on the streets for it. And so you can see a real, this clash is gonna become more and more. By the way, patents, patents are for 20 years usually. You know, minus the time to get them through. Imagine when the cycle of change is happening 12, 14, 24 months. So this is gonna become a bigger and bigger problem. And that's why our gridlock now couldn't be, ha there's never a good time for gridlock. It couldn't be happening at a worse time. You know, right when we need to be totally on our game, uh, gridlock is happening um, in a, uh, at, at, at a terrible time. The other thing that, the, the one advantage we would have, I have a whole section on this, is um, in this world though, which we're also squandering, is in, in the age of acceleration, um, uh, um, the ROI on pluralism is going to explode. Okay, the return on investment on pluralism for two reasons. One is all top-down authority structures are collapsing. 
We saw that in Iraq, we've seen it in Syria. And therefore, if you actually can forge social contracts horizontally in your society, um, you're gonna have a huge advantage in this age when so many people are gonna be moving um, and where we're gonna be becoming a minority majority country over the next 25 years. We're just seeing the front end of that challenge now. But if you do have pluralism, if you can forge one out of many, you have a huge advantage. And in the age of acceleration, if you have pluralism, uh, your ability to access talent and move at a faster rate in order to innovate also is off the charts. So I think you're gonna see another divide in the world of countries that can manage pluralism uh, horizontally and those who have to manage it vertically from the top down with an iron fist. And those countries uh, are also gonna be devastated uh, in this era because they can't work together. Unfortunately, we're starting to mirror them in our country. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Ludwig Blarock. I'm working for the European Union mission here in DC. And I'm actually following up on what you just said there. Um, in a certain sense, the challenges that you described are not totally new. I mean, migration has been throughout the centuries one of the sort of constants, chaos, crises, political instability, um, differences between rich and poor being key drivers. So that's all new. And in, in a sense, and the US and European states are products of migration, only it's been 1,000 or 2,000 or a couple of hundred years ago. So that's not totally new. However, when, when you say um, the world is disintegrating and there's these challenges opening up, my question is really, are you or how worried are you about retrenchment in our societies in the Western world, about the idea of pulling up walls, physical ones and mental ones, societal ones, and I'm not only talking about the US, I'm talking about Europe just as much, yeah. when really the answer would be to build up those states, to make conditions right that people can stay where they want to stay, because all those Americans that you met in Senegal, or that you didn't meet because they moved already, when you asked them, they all would prefer to stay home. Absolutely. Only conditions are not right. Absolutely. So really the response from the Western world would be to make conditions right and not to retrench. Yeah. And so that's one question. The second question, much shorter, is when, when you say, and I believe you're right, nowhere in time was the individual as powerful as he is today. With is the, what? the individual as powerful. Yeah for positive or negative, to wreak havoc or to create fantastic new things. Wouldn't the answer also be how do we empower the individual and make him responsible to counter everything that's bad? We look out for the one terrorist in a huge group, police can't do it, but his neighbors and friends might be able to. In the same sense in the political sphere or in the economic sphere. So how do we empower the individual to take up their responsibility and go against it? Thank you. Really good questions. Where were you from? I didn't, I didn't hear. Uh, I represent the European Union here, but I'm from Germany myself. Great. Um, so those are really good questions. Um, uh, migration's not, you know, not, not new at all, particularly in Africa. Although migration in Africa tended to be, if uh, there was a drought, we left and then we came back. And, and what you're seeing now is something quite different. Many more people leaving permanently. Okay, I think the numbers are much higher and they all wanna go to one place. Um, and so I think, and they're coming now from many different countries at once. So I think it's a scale and speed problem uh, and that's why there are more people on the move in the world today since World War II, um, uh, you know, according to the International Migration Organization. Um, you know, I didn't really get to describe my book in detail, but your second question is so beautiful because it's exactly what the last half of the book is about. So the book, pardon me? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, did I mention it's on Amazon? Um, it's a, uh, um, Basically, the book is divided into three parts, ex uh, accelerating, reimagining, and the last part is called anchoring. Um, and so I'll just share with you the penultimate chapter, um, uh, which is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Um, and it comes from the best question I ever got on book tour, 1999, I'm in Portland, Oregon, I'm at the Portland Theater, and a man stands up in the balcony and says, Mr. Friedman, I have a question is God in cyberspace? And I thought, wow, I, I, I don't know. I've never been asked that question before. And I was really kind of embarrassed. I said, I'm sorry, I just don't have an answer for you. And so um, I went home and I called my spiritual sort of teacher. He's a rabbi, lives in Amsterdam, a great Talmudic scholar, Tzvi Marx. I met him when I was in the New York Times, correspondent in Israel. I called him up, I said, Tzvi, I got a question. I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have answered? And he said, well, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. One is biblical and one is post-biblical. So the biblical view of God is that he's almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. 
And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of gambling, pornography, uh, cybercrime, uh, cheating, lying, and prevarication. Uh, but we have a, a biblical, we have a post-biblical view of God, which said God says God manifests himself, his presence, by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. Now, I actually put that story in the paperback edition of the Lexus and the Olive Tree. And what I found was over the last couple of years, I found myself retelling that story. So I revived it for this book and tried to ask myself, why am I telling that story now? It's because so much human activity has moved into cyberspace where we're all connected, but no one's in charge. And therefore, the values question in this world really matters more than ever. Because of these three accelerations, we now stand at a intersection as a human species where we've never stood before. In 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us. If it had to be one country, I'm glad it was mine. Today, with these accelerations, we're entering a world where one person will be able to kill all of us, and at the same time, all of us could fix everything with these same technologies. If we really put our mind to it, we could actually feed, house, and clothe everyone on the planet. We have never, as a human species, stood at an intersection where one of us could kill all of us, and all of us could fix everything. And if that's where we are, what does it mean? It means we are more godlike as a species than we have ever been. And if we're godlike, we better have the Ten Commandments. That values are going to matter more than ever. And therefore, I have a whole chapter on can the golden rule make a comeback. Whatever the version is in your faith, everyone's got some version of it. Because we now live in a world where more people can do unto others from farther away and more others can do unto you from farther away. And what that means is the golden rule has to bring, make a comeback. Now, I know what you're thinking. We got this knucklehead from the New York Times speaking to special ops about the golden rule. Is there anything more naive? And my motto is, in this age of acceleration, naivete is the new realism. Because I'll tell you what's really naive. In a world of this much distributed and amplified power that's so interdependent that we're going to be OK, in a world of breakers without the golden rule making a comeback. And that then leads to the last section of the book. How can the golden rule make a comeback? There's only two vehicles, it seems to me, strong families and healthy communities. That when people are nested, and you really said it in your question, the greatest restraints on human behavior are actually not guardrails and laws and police. They're cultural, religious, family, and communal norms. And therefore, the whole last part of the book is an argument for why the healthy community, not the nation state, not the single family, too weak and frail, the nation state too distant, why it is going to be healthy communities that are the most important building block for the 21st century. And uh, it, it's for the reasons uh, that you said. Very quickly, I know we got to end. I'll just tell you one story, because we're at the 15th anniversary of 9-11. I happened to be in Israel on 9-11, covering the Intifada. And that night of 9-11, I knew the chief of military intelligence. I called him and I said, I need to know everything you know about suicide bombing. And they wanted to get together, too, to talk about you know, my experience in Beirut. So in the morning of 9-12, I met at the Ministry of Defense with the Chief of Military Intelligence and his team. And this is what they told me, and it affected my thinking ever after. This is a summary of what I, what I heard from him. Tom, we're really good. We got the West Bank, Gaza wired. We can get Ahmed before he blows up a pizza parlor. We can get Gibran before he blows up a disco. We can get so-and-so before he blows up a bus. But, but Muhammad will get through unless the village says no. It takes a village. And what we have got to understand now is that it actually takes a planet. That in a world this interdependent, the proper 
sort of governing unit now we have to think of, the moral unit, is actually of a planetary scale. If you want to understand it, go see the movie The Martian um, and watch the scene at the end where the Americans and the Chinese cooperate to get our Martian, our man stranded off Mars and watch how many people in the audience applaud. Okay? Um, and you may think it's fiction, but what is really tapping is that understanding now that the proper governing unit is now at a planetary scale when morally we can affect each other on a planetary scale and therefore values and healthy communities are gonna make, have to make a huge comeback. Otherwise, we are going to be a bad biological experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. General Trask, would you like to come forward, please? Mr. Friedman, I want to say thank you for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. We have a, a little presento, but, uh, but uh, your remarks today are really going to help us this afternoon in understanding how uh, the continuing rapid rise of technology is going to affect how we deal military, militarily with the migration and immigration issues. Wonderful. So uh, uh, really appreciate your My pleasure. With you and, and it's great. Like thank you very this. much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.